Hello, Arup sir. Good morning, good morning, sir. So let us start, sir, our program, okay, sir. Let other participants join slowly. We will start our program. Uh, so, uh, Namaskar and good morning. So, welcome to our today's webinar on community based early warning system and uh, which is jointly organized by National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, New Delhi, in collaboration with all Tripura Disaster Response Volunteer Association, uh, where we have been joined by Sri Arup sir, uh, who is looking after that. But uh, before moving on to the our actual webinar, I would just like to set the context that, uh, you know, Indian Ocean region is extremely vulnerable to cyclones or flood or drought and even tropical storms. So this recurrent climate related shocks, it, it negatively impacts the highly sensitive livelihood and our community and even the economy in the region. And it, it also erodes our com community's ability to fully recover leading to increased fragility and vulnerability to subsequent uh, disasters. And if you'll see that the nature and the pattern of the weather related disasters is, is continuously shifting and is becoming more unpredictable and increasing in frequency, intensity and magnitude as a result of climate change. And even vulnerability is the, uh, is the region is further compounded by prevailing negative socioeconomic factors uh, you talk about the extreme poverty, you talk about the growing insecurity, the demo, uh, demographic, uh, the demographic uh, growth and trends, the COVID-19 uh, current situation, which has more compounded the, our disasters. All this has rather make our community more and more vulnerable. But here, one thing is very important to notice that one of the key tools of disaster risk management that can build the resilience of community prone to this uh, cycle of uh, disasters and increase vulnerability is the concept of early warning. And this whole concept of early warning, which saves lives by uh, alerting the population of an imminent danger, uh, the community, empowering them to make decisions that can help protect their lives and also their livelihood and their uh, whatever infrastructures and assets that they have. So that's why we thought that uh, uh, we need to discuss the importance of community based early warning system and this early warning when we, when we link this early warning to early action, it will help to mitigate the effect of a shock of a community that will uh, you know, protect the hard and gains the community has made in enhancing the future prospect for their women, for their children, for their men, boys, girls that are residing in the community. So to discuss this in more detail, uh, but before we move ahead, we are joined by Professor uh, Surya Prakash, who is the head of GMR division and IDM, and who is also the chair of this webinar. Uh, I will request him to set the context of the webinar um, with his inaugural address. Uh, sir, if you are there, please set over to you. One second, just let me check. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning, Dr. Sir, Ajit. yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, please. We have already started. Uh, we have give. I have given the general description. I have also introduced you, sir. Now the floor is yours, sir, for the inaugural address. Sir. Okay, thank you, uh, friends. Uh, first of all, let me welcome the dignitaries in the inaugural program, uh, distinguished experts for today's program, and also the delegates and participants. On uh, behalf of National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, and on my personal behalf, uh, you know that uh, disaster management is a very important issue these days, looking into the invasion of COVID-19 in the form of the new variant Omicron and uh, its impacts on our population 
not only within India, but even in other countries is very, very important. But uh, these kind of events are not happening in isolation. They are also happening along with other disasters. For example, uh, today night, tonight, last night also, I was in Uttarakhand and uh, we did face an earthquake. Maybe it was of a small magnitude and also landslides on our way to our destinations. And also in different parts of the country, we are facing uh, various type of hazards, including the uh, number of cyclones that we have faced during the COVID-19 situation, including the Ampan cyclone, Yas, Taute, and several others. So preparedness, against these kind of disaster situations is a key to our risk reduction and resilience. And also, uh, we need to actually work on a larger basis for community-based early warning systems. Although our nodal agencies for early warning systems, they have been regularly detecting, monitoring, diagnosing, and deciphering the possibilities of potential disasters uh, and also looking into the probabilities of uh, their occurrence in terms of uh, the changing climatic conditions, the faster rate of uh, development and other human interventions. So we have to work together as a team, as it said, team means together each achieve more and uh, we have to work with the communities, involve them in our process of risk reduction and resilience, and also prepare our uh, local level plans, involve the local governments, including uh, the PRIs and the municipal corporations and, and uh, municipal bodies, as well as the local rep elected representatives, the government functionaries, and uh, the officials who are responsible for uh, various uh, developmental and disaster management related activities. And at the academics, uh, we are trying to conduct this subject and uh, teach the upcoming generations about disaster management. UGC, AICT, they have already made this subject as uh, an optional subject for all streams of education. And some of the universities, they have actually launched UG and PG courses on disaster management. We hope that uh, in future, we will be able to have more trained, educated, skilled and equipped human resources than what we had in earlier times. And that will also help us in reducing the risk and enhancing the resilience. This program is our endeavor in those directions. I wish all the best uh, to uh, the organizing team for coordinating this program. And also uh, my best wishes to the distinguished experts and speakers of today's program for their deliberation as well as I will urge all the participants and delegates to time kindly note down the key takeaway points and implement in their day-to-day -day practices as well as uh, make endeavors towards preparation of disaster risk reduction and resilience plans. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raju, uh, for providing me this opportunity and uh, wish you all the best for the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for joining us uh, for your inaugural address. And that also in between your lectures that you are, are currently giving on and you have made time to encourage us, uh, uh, you know, through your inaugural address, sir. Thank you very much for that. So now, dear participant, with that, uh, now we'll move on directly to our technical session. We have a, we have 
we have been joined by several speakers today, distinguished speakers. We are we are joined by Ambassador Saad Umar Farooq sir, who is a certified disaster professional. He is directly joining us from, uh, from Nigeria. We also have our uh, Dr. Harjit Kaur, who is working here as a junior consultant in NIDM. We also have uh, Sri Anil Kathet, uh, who is also working as a junior consultant in NIDM. And later on, uh, we, we will be joined by Sri Arup Dhar also who is the senior community disaster response volunteer from all Tripura disaster response volunteer association. And later on, uh, I will be also talking uh, something on the theme of the webinar. But before we move ahead, uh, I would like to uh, request all the participants that uh, do feel uh, that you have a role to play in this webinar and your role is clearing all your doubts, raising questions, whatever you have, even a small bit, you please feel free to raise your questions and try to uh, make this whole webinar a two-way conversation rather than one-way conversation. So uh, we, 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 for that, what you can do is you can directly write down your questions in the chat box uh, that if you are using your desktop or a mobile that you can see on their uh, bottom right side, there is chat window or apart from that, you can also use that Q&A window to raise your questions. So uh, with that being said, uh, let us uh, directly move to our first presentation of uh, today. So for that, uh, we have been joined by uh, Ambassador Saad Umar Farooq, sir, who is the Certified Disaster Professional from uh, Nigeria. And sir will be talking about uh, community disaster preparedness. Uh, sir, if you can hear me, uh, the floor is all yours, sir. Thank you very much, uh, doctor. I can hear you loud and clear. And it's my great pleasure to join the disaster management community. I can say international disaster management community. Is my screen visible, sir? Yes, sir. Absolutely, sir. Good. So at least into the business of the day and that is why we are, we are all here as i said earlier i thank almighty god for giving me the opportunity to be part of this uh, mind-blowing uh, training i'm going to talk on community disaster preparedness i am ambassador saad umar farooq a registered dental technologist a certified disaster professional uh, fellow or uh, Association of Disaster Managers Without Borders, Fellow International Institute of Disaster Management and Safety Science, Fellow Chartered Institute of Disaster and Safety Managers USA, Fellow Climate Change Professionals of Nigeria, Fellow Corporate Research Institute and Strategic Studies, Member Association of Dental Technologies of Nigeria, Member International Institute of Professional Security, Member Nigeria Osseo Integration and Dental Implantology Society. Associate Member Global Intelligence Peace and Security Institute USA, Associate Member Counterterrorism and Security Professionals USA, and a Certified Ethical Hacker. I am the one that is going to uh, talk on community disaster preparedness. Um, well, before I of this uh, program is early warning system. You know, disaster is disaster management is everyone's business because they don't ring bell before they happen so into the business introduction when disasters strike an unprepared community the damage can be incredible ironically many communities are often not prepared because disasters do not happen often when no sense of immediate need community preparedness is really a priority because why do we prepare so that we should not be caught off guided. However, vulnerability reduction must continue. Communities must be made ready for disaster impacts. Historically, communities have allocated human, physical, and financial resources quickly in order to meet urgent human needs. Putting these resources in place has naturally varied in their timing, effectiveness, efficiency, and reliability. 
which are critical factors in the cost that is measured either in life loss or property damage and or destroyed. Community-based preparedness and planning allow us to manage the potential hazards following a disaster event. Individually, we can prepare our homes and families to get through those critical times. Communities can also plan to work together to reduce injury, death, and property damage. Community preparedness will improve the ability of individuals and groups to reduce the effects of hazard impact and manage their resources until assistance is available. Post-disaster studies have shown that groups perform better during disaster response with prior planning. That is to say, as a group, we can, we can act better and more effectively in managing disasters. They also show that organized community efforts may be more successful if integrated into the social and political processes of a community, association, workplace, school, and the rest of them, even place of worship. Now, effective response needs comprehensive planning and coordination of all who will be involved, which includes the private sector, schools, volunteer groups, and community organizations. Training and information can prepare individuals and groups to be crucial resources in their community, capable of performing many emergency functions needed during the immediate post-disaster period. This presentation is designed to help communities and individuals prepare for and respond to hazards that affect their communities. It focuses on the physical hazards of disaster, disasters. However, there are some emotional aspects as well. Living through a major emergency or disaster may cause fatigue, hyperactivity, anger, and withdrawal. Children and elderly are more vulnerable to these types of post-impact psychological effects. Being prepared for and aware of the risks of hazard events, taking steps to, the, to reduce them can eventually reduce their negative effects and or resulting damage. Becoming involved in community disaster management could greatly improve the preparedness and response capability of our community. One way to do this is to volunteer your services to your local community. And I believe that is why we are all here today because the professor has said it, that we are looking forward to have a well-educated community, but not only well-educated in other endeavors, but with the technical knowledge and skills on how to manage disaster. Before I dive in, I want to see some terms used in disaster management. Disaster, a situation resulting from an environmental phenomenon or human-induced conflict that produces stress, personal injury, physical damage, and economic disruption of great magnitude. It causes intense negative impacts on people, goods, services, and or the environment and exceeds the effective community's capability to respond to it. It is important to note that even though disasters are referred to by the event that caused them, a disaster is not the event itself. We should take note of that. For example, an earthquake is a natural phenomenon. If it does not strike a populated area with weak buildings, it is not likely to be a disaster. What I mean here is like when there's an earthquake, which happens in a place where there are no people, no living people, we cannot refer to it disaster, as a disaster because disaster is a, is a, is a negative act, uh, act that will happen where there must be great magnitude of loss of lives, properties, and in short, even damage to the uh, environment in which that particular community cannot be able to combat it using their own resources. That means they must need Inter, uh, external assistance. Disaster management is a collective term encompassing all aspects for and responding to emergencies and disasters, including both pre and post activities. The management of risks and consequences of an event. Disaster recovery is a planned and coordinated process of supporting disaster affected communities in reconstruction of the environment, physical infrastructure, and restoration of emotional, social, economic, and physical welfare of that particular population. 
now an emergency. A period of time in which there's a clear and marked deterioration in the coping capabilities of a group or a community. Additionally, it is a situation in which coping abilities are only sustained by an unusual initiatives by the group or community or by external intervention. Hazard is the potential occurrence of natural or man-made event slash disaster that has negative consequences. Risk is the probability that a disaster will occur given the hazard and the vulnerability. Vulnerability is the susceptibility of persons, structures, or systems affected by a hazard. Climate change. Any change in global temperatures and precipitations uh, due to time of uh, natural variability to human activity. So this term will help us understand the subject of discussion. Now, let us, we are, I'm going to talk about a community. So let me start by defining a community. According to Wikipedia, a community is a social unit, that is a group of living things with co commonality such as norms, religion, values, customs, or identity. Communities may share a sense of place situated in a given geographical area, e.g. a country, a village, town or neighborhood, or in a virtual space through communication platforms. Just like now, we are one community under the National Institute of Disaster Management uh, that organized by National Institute of Disaster Management and all Tripura uh, disaster response volunteers. We are one community as at now occupying a virtual space. Now, durable relations that extend beyond immediate Genealogical ties also define a sense of community. Important to the identity, practice, and roles in social institutions such as family, home, work, government, society, or humanity at large. Although communities are usually small relative to personal societies, community may also refer to a large group affiliations such as national communities, international communities, and virtual communities. Now, disaster preparedness, because that is the main uh, topic of our discussion this morning. Why should we prepare for disaster? Disaster preparedness is everyone's business. Whosoever, whatsoever class you belong to, you must be part of our disaster preparedness plan. There are many hazards which threaten our communities. When these hazards actually come into contact with us, they may affect our lives, and the resources we have to deal with them, thereby causing emergency or disaster situations. To know how to respond to a possible threat, the community needs to be organized and prepared with the correct information and tools to be effective. Being prepared and knowing what to do can reduce fear and anxiety, thereby reducing losses that may result from a disaster event. Therefore, communities, families, and individuals should know what to do in the event of any form of disaster. If they have to evacuate their homes, they should know where is the nearest emergency shelter located and what item should be taken to taken there. Now, emergency planning and disaster supplies. Directly after an emergency, essential services may be cut off and local disaster relief and government responders may not be able to reach your community right away. So that is the main reason why as a community, you must prepare yourself against the unforeseen circumstances. As such, knowing what to do to protect yourself, your family and property is essential. Each family should create a disaster uh, plan. Now, disaster plan at the family level. I want to start from a family level because when you understand before, we can now go outside now. Number one, know the natural or man-made hazards that could affect your community. You have to identify them. You have to know them. You have to be familiar with them and seek advice on how to best prepare or mitigate these hazards. This information may be obtained from the Department of Disaster Management or your zonal committee. Two, talk to your household about potential hazards or emergencies, how they should respond to them and what they would need to do if they had to evacuate. Plan three, plan how your household will stay in contact with each other if separated. Identify two meeting places 
One should be near your home in case of fire, and the other should be away from home at a neighbor or family member in case you cannot return home. Four, choose a friend or relative who lives outside your area for family members to call and say that they are okay. Five, draw a floor plan of your home and mark out escape routes from each room that is for your own members or family. Six, post emergency telephone numbers by the telephone and teach children how and when to use them because children are part of the uh, people who must learn who must learn how to sorry um because emergency television yes make sure everyone in the household knows how to shut off gas water and electricity at the main switches consult with your local utility companies if you have any questions in respect of that. Eight, join a local community emergency response team, which is organized through zonal committees and the Department of Disaster Management. This will give you the necessary training in the basic requirements for identifying potential hazards, and if necessary, assisting the response to hazards which may affect your uh, community. You see why I'm emphasizing on hazard hazard, because if you can identify your hazards before they manifest into disaster and deal with them, definitely disaster will be managed because the theme of this training is early warning. Nine, to reduce the economic impact of disasters on your household or property, you must one, review property insurance policies regularly, two, protect your household financial well being before disaster strikes, see, Ensure that health insurance policies are current and meet your requirement. Then 10, also include neighbors with special needs into your plan. That is the elderly and the disabled, because that is one area I want to also talk. Because the most vulnerable people in most communities will normally say women and children, but we used to forget about people with disabilities. We have to include them in our plans of preparedness, because if we don't, they may be the ones that will either draw us back or we will now allow them to go with the disaster. So now let's look of uh, look for care of children in disasters. Children depend on daily routines. They wake up, eat breakfast, go to school and play with friends, which when emergencies or disasters interrupt this routine, children may become anxious. In a disaster, they will look to you and other adults for help. How to react to an emergency gives them a clue on how to act. If you react with alarm, a child may become more scared. They see our fear as a proof that the danger is real. If you seem overcome with a sense of loss, a child may feel their losses more strongly. Be aware that after disaster, children are most afraid that one, the event will happen again, two, someone will be injured or killed, three, they will be separated from their family, and four, they will be left alone. So that fear depends on how you, as the parent or the elders, react. Now, preparing the children. Teach your child how and when to call for help. Check the telephone directory for local emergency phone numbers and post these phone numbers by all your telephones. Even very young children can be taught how and when to call for emergency assistance. Help your information. Children should memorize their family name, address, phone number, and name of school and or early childhood center. They should also know where to meet in case of emergency. Because if you don't carry them along during that preparation, uh, if you don't carry them along during that, they may not have the enough memory there are some younger ones that cannot be able to memorize this information all you need to do is to have a small index card or imagine or that contains all the emergency information put it in their own box or anything that any elderly person have seen them can be able to go through and get important information about you now so Disaster, um, you know, we are talking about preparedness. One important aspect of disaster preparedness is having a disaster supply kit. 
One of the most important tools for emergency preparedness is disaster supply kit. Listed below are the most important items. You can get more, but I just I, itemize some important ones. One, two weeks supply of prescription medicines. Two, two weeks supply of non-perishable or special dietary food. Three, drinking water in containers, one gallon per person per day for two weeks. Four, flashlight and batteries for each member of the family. The next one is portable radio because radio is very, very important that uses batteries so that anywhere you are, you can be able to have information. Then first aid book and kit, including bandages, antiseptic, tape, compresses, non-aspirin pain reliever, anti-diarrhea medication. The next one is two coolers, one to keep food and one for ice. The next one is plastic tap for roof, window repair, screening, tools, nails, etc. Then water purification kit like the tablets, bleach, chlorine, that is a plain chlorine and iodine. Then infant necessities, that is medicine, sterile, uh, sterile water, uh, diapers, ready formula, bottles. Then you need a clean up supplies, that is like mop, bucket, towels, disinfectant. Then non-electric can opener and plastic trash bags. The next one is toilet paper, paper towels, and primocioride towels then fire extinguisher, complete set of clothes, shoes, and gloves, etc. Then personal sanitary items, important documents stored in a watertight. So if you can get minimum of this one as your disaster supply kit, that will be handy at any given time. Now, protecting your animals, because we are talking about community. In community, we, those are things that are very physical with us. Pet owners are responsible for the protection of their pets during disaster events. If you plan to evacuate, plan for your pet as well. Pets are not allowed in public emergency shelters, so it is advisable to make prior arrangements to shelter pets. Then livestock, such as cattle, sheep, goats, and horses and donkeys, allow them to graze in an open area. Don't tie them, because when you tie them, when disaster strikes, there is a tendency they will get injured or they will die. Then be cautious when approaching wild animals during emergency situations. Do not corner them. Wild animals will likely feel threatened and they can either endanger your life or they, they endanger their lives uh, themselves. So another important aspect uh, of disaster preparedness is having your pet survival kit for those that have pet. One, color, uh, color, uh, proper ID collar and tag. Two, carrier or cage. Three, leash. Four, ample food supply at least for two weeks. Five, water food bowls for your pet. Six, any necessary medication for your pet. Seven, specific care instructions. Eight, newspaper, cat litter, scoop, plastic trash bags for handling waste. You know, animals can, your pet can waste. So you must prepare on how to handle their waste. Then proper ID on all the belongings. Then non-electric can opener. Then make sure your pets have had all their vaccinations or shots within the past 12 months. Now, let's see tips for hotel operators because we are talking about community. I also want to, because in most of our communities, we have hotel operators. So let's see tips for them in our a preparedness plan. Without creating panic, hoteliers should alert guests to the situation on an ongoing basis. Once relevant bulletins are being received and kept, them posted of developments and appraise of your establishment disaster plan. You shall, you must carry them along with their hotel disaster management plans also. If the situation deteriorates, consider suggesting their departure and assist those who wish to evacuate. The next one is anyone staying should be briefed on shelter locations and procedures and provided with basic essentials, non-perishable food, hygiene articles, water, beddings, etc. Now, tips for farmers. As I said earlier, for our livestock, cattle, sheep, goats, and horses, don't tie them. Allow them to be moving on an open grazing so that they can save themselves in case if there's any disaster. Ensure that drains in the fields are cleared of debris. A clock of drain can flood your farm and destroy your crops. Now, tips for fishermen and butters. Before the onset of a tropical storm or hurricane, it is very important for fishermen and boat owners to secure their boats and equipment. The following precautions should be followed. 
both moorings, anchors, chains, cables, and ropes should be kept in good condition and rechecked well in advance. Monitor and listen to radio all the time for information. Remove fish ponds and gear out water at the first warning. Remove boats from water if possible. Take them to approved marine shelter. Now, protecting your business. Use the following checklist to prepare business or disaster recovery plan. Number one, know your risks. Have your buildings inspected by licensed professionals to find out if your workplace is vulnerable to various hazards which may affect the community and request recommendations for retroproofing if necessary. Now, take the necessary precautions. If a storm threatens, secure your building. Cover windows. Cover and move equipment furniture to a secure area. Always protect your data with backup files. If dependent on data processing, consider keeping backs up and an alternative site that is an off-site location. Make provisions for alternative communications and power. Like the amateur radio is a very welcome, that is the ham radio. It is a very alternative for communications in case if there's disaster. Make plans to resume work with limited resources, that is water and power. Store emergency supplies at the office. Now, the next aspect is how to protect your employees. Employee safety comes first in your business uh, uh, plan. Prepare, distribute, and exercise your business continuity plan. Consider providing shelter to employees and their families and helping them with supplies after disaster event. Establish a rendezvous point for employees in, an, in the event of a building or office evacuation. Establish a call down procedure for warning and post storm communication. Then provide photo ID to all your staff. Now, disaster preparedness for people with disabilities. Yes, these are special people I have in mind because in most situations, we don't put them into our plan. So I encourage us, while we drawing our community uh, disaster plan, we must also include the people with disabilities. Many people will have dis a disability, either short-term or permanent, that will limit their ability to move around. Disabilities manifest themselves in varying degrees. Everyone needs to have a plan to be able to evacuate a building, regardless of his or her physical condition. When preparing for a disaster, we must consider carefully all aspects and categories of disabilities. Let's look at the, these five general categories of disabilities. We have the visual impairments, hearing impairments, speech impairments, cognitive impairments. These are the five types uh, of impairments, disabilities that is identified. Now, advice for persons with disabilities. If you are in a wheelchair, when earthquake begins, lock your wheels. Keep your service animals with you in a safe place at home or take them with you to a shelter. Service animals, don't forget, service animals are the only animals allowed in a shelter. If you are taking your service animal to an emergency shelter, remember, these places cannot care for your animal. Do not forget to take the pet survival kit of your service animal with you. Install at least one smoke detector on each level of your home, outside sleeping areas. Install a system with a flashing strobe light for the hearing impaired. For those that will not hear, you, but can see, at least your alarm system must be flashing light. Replace batteries in detectors at least once a year. Such on like on your birthdays, New Year, any day that is important that you can remember. And don't forget to test whether it is working from time to time. Now we have home, home healthcare and homebound patients. We have some patients that are living in the house. We should also include them in our disaster preparedness. Build a support team of people who are usually in the same area as you and can help you in an emergency if necessary. The real first responders in emergency are often your neighbors, friends, and coworkers. Build support teams with many people at every place where you spend large part of your day at work, home, school, or volunteer site. This is especially important when it is hard to predict who will be where you are at a given time. Practice with different people to figure out who will best be able to help you. Look for people with the following qualities. Strong, calm, listen well, communicate clearly, can guide you safely and attends to personal details. Work with people who are dependable and have the physical and emotional ability to assist you reliably. Now, plan multiple ways to give and get information. This one is also a ways of 
communication because communication is very, very important in all endeavors of our life, more especially when it comes to disaster management. Different communication systems work differently. In an emergency, some may work when others fail. The more systems you have available to you, the more likely it is that you will be able to contact other people during disasters. Some, type, uh, some communications include email, internet, pages, text messaging, a standard phone that does not need electricity, cell phone, low cost, that is two-way radio, ham radio, and social media. Then master the skills of giving quick information on how best to help you. This I'm referring to people with disability now. Sometimes you have to build a support team on the spot. Think about what you will need, how you want it done, and what kind of people you want to work with if you have the choice. Be ready to give people who may not know you clear, specific, concise information they need to be able to help you without causing injury. For example, connect the battery by the window to my vent by following instructions attached to the battery. Or take my oxygen tank right by the side of the green bookcase. I can breathe without it for 15 minutes. Or take my communication device from the table by the wall. Or take my manual wheelchair. So all these things, you must find a way of communicating, giving those people who will help you clear instructions on how to assist you in order not to provide more injuries to you. Keep at least seven days supply of medication. Sorry for the intervention. Keep at least seven days supply of medication on hand. Ask your doctor or pharmacist with what you should do if you cannot immediately get more. If you undergo treatment administered by a clinic or hospital, ask your provider how to provide for a stroke in case if there's disaster. What am I going to do? What is my option B? Now, seven, install at least one smoke alarm on each level of your home. Then complete a summary checklist to make sure that your personal data, uh, disaster plan is comprehensive. Be sure to include every important information about you. Keep a disaster supply kit in your home, car and workplace at any time. Then make your home or office safer by checking hallways, stairways, doorways, windows, just to remove any hazard that may keep you away from escaping. Now, evacuation. Evacuation is the last resort when it comes to disaster management. Because in a situation where you cannot handle, the best thing is to leave that place. Evacuation, be able to assist if an evacuation order is issued. Provide physical assistance in leaving the home, office, or transferring to a vehicle. Provide transportation to a shelter. This may require a specialized vehicle designed to carry all those people with disability. Although evacuations are not that common, we should still prepare to evacuate if the need does arise. If and when community evacuations become necessary, local officials will provide information to the public through the National Emergency Broadcast System via the media, television, and radios, and the others. To be prepared for an emergency, you should have your disaster supply kit ready. The amount of time you have to evacuate will depend on the disaster. If the event can be monitored like the hurricane, you might have a day or two to get ready. However, events such as flash floods and the rest do not even give you time to prepare. So you must have your evacuation plan ahead. This is where I'm going. This is how we are going to evacuate because your safety is for emergency updates. Now, Planning for evacuation. Ask the Department of Disaster Management or your local community zone on what if you do not uh, on the disaster evacuation plans. Now, if you do not own a car, make transportation arrangement with family or friends. Talk with your household about the possibility of evacuation. The next one is plan where you will go if you had to leave the community. Again, ask a friend outside your community to be the checkpoint so that everyone in the household can call that person to say, hey, Mr. Arub, I am okay. Mr. Uh, Dr. This, I am okay. Assemble a disaster supply kit ready all the time. Keep fuel in your car if an evacuation seems likely because gas stations may not be open to give you gas. 
because of maybe breakdown of electricity supply and the rest of them. Now, recovery from disaster. This session offers some general advice on steps to take after disaster strikes to begin putting your home, your community, and your life back to normal. Now, let's start with the health and safety. Your first concern after disaster is your household health and safety. One, be aware of new or secondary hazards created by the disaster. Watch for wash out roads, contaminated buildings, contaminated water, gas leaks, broken glass, damaged wires, and the rest of them, and slippery flows. Two, be aware of exhaustion. Do not try to do too much at once. Set priorities and pace yourself. Drink plenty of clean water. Eat well and get enough rest. Wear sturdy boots and gloves all the time as insulators. Wash your hands thoroughly with soap and clean water often when working in debris. Inform authorities about health and safety hazards, including chemical release, down power lines, wash out drawers, smoldering insulation, or dead animals. Now, disaster and mental health. How do people react after disaster? Most people show signs of emotional stress as an immediate reaction to a disaster. Different people react differently, and most recover spontaneously with the help of others. Information on disasters and mental health can assist relief workers to identify and communicate better with affected cases and to be alert for abnormal behavior. It can also assist in early treatment, thereby increasing the chances of recovery. Now, phases of those reactions. We have the pre-impact, warning, impact, and recovery. The pre-impact is the period when a disaster is known to be impending. Behavior patterns vary, but may include underactivity, refusal to prepare for disaster impact, tendency to adopt an, an attitude that the disaster would not occur, and anxiety. Then warning. That period is when disasters is imminent and warnings are posted, announced. Some behavior patterns may include frantic search for information on what to do next, uh, overreaction, sometimes described as panic, restlessness, and calmness then the impact or uh, reaction. The period during which the disaster event occurs, some behavior patterns are large portion of population may be stunned, show confusion, paralysis, and anxiety. There is a hardcore of survivors. Some of the survivors may be oppressed who will uh, accept the situation and decide on action. This group provides the leadership, helps relieve distress, and organizes rescue services and communications. Then the recovery. Immediately after impact, when individuals had had time to talk of the situation, some reactions are gradually returned to awareness, recall emotions of fear, anger, loss of trust, dependency, and anxiety. Alternative periods of crying and laughing and childlike dependency. So these are some of the reactions. How do we manage them? Preparation is the key. Reaction to disasters are largely influenced by the psychological state of the individual before the disaster. The stability, the stability of the home, community, and country is also a very important factor influencing, influencing, influencing the type of uh, personal reaction. Preparation of the individual long before disaster strikes is the best form of boosting the mental state to cope with emergencies. Excuse me. Now, measures before disasters. Provide as much information on disasters at the family level. Possible hazards, their possible effects and how to cope. Rehearsal of survival techniques and family discussions of past disasters and their effects. Develop personal and family plan for dealing with disasters. Organize group training sessions to demonstrate to the individual that he or she is not alone in the impending danger. Now, treatment after disasters. Relief workers, friends, and family can assist the individuals by one, allowing rest for a few hours, establishing close personal contact, encouraging emotional expression and airings of experiences, catering the need for affected person to be given something like food, blanket, clothing, just or whole hand or smile, a simple smile to them will go a long way. Organizing survivors into support groups for treatment, encouragement, and activity in relief programs. Do not underestimate the power of prayers also. Explain what has happened and the steps being taken. Providing centralized treatment with other victims near disaster site. 
this help individual to feel part of the group that they belong. Now we have the emotionally wounded. People can be emotionally upset for long periods after disasters and affected by such factors as seriousness of disaster, degree of disruption of personal connection, instinct of disruption of pre-existing way of life. Now, responses to disfigurement, dismemberment, mutilation may also add reactions. Some reactions are relief and reflecting on the feeling of good fortune. This is soon replaced by a sense of exasperation, frustration, or anger, especially in those losing family, property, or belongings during the disaster. Now, how do we manage the emotionally wounded? Management usually involves social, psychological, and spiritual support with opportunities for expression, such as supportive relationships, which will allow feelings or anxiety to be tested. Then maintaining contact of individuals with primary groups and other familiar links. Now, coping with the disaster. You should be aware of signs that persons need help in coping with the stress of a disaster event. One important thing to remember when trying to understand a disaster event is no one who sees a disaster is untouched by it unless if he is not a human being. It is normal for persons to feel anxious about their own safety as well as that of their friends and family members. Profound sadness, grief and anger are normal reactions to disaster events. Acknowledging your feelings help you to recover. Focusing on your strength and ability to also help you to recover. With each, uh, have, we each have different ways of coping with stress after disasters, in short, in life generally. Now, these are some signs. When you see in an adult, you know that he needs um, management or counseling. Difficulty in communicating thoughts, difficulty in sleeping, difficulty in maintaining balance, easily frustrated, Increased use of drugs or alcohol, very short or limited attention span, poor work performance, headaches and stomach problems, tunnel vision or muffled hearing, cause or flu-like symptoms, disorientation or confusion, difficulty in concentrating, depression and or sadness, feeling of hopelessness, mood swings and crying easily, guilt and self-doubt. So the moment you see any of this sign on somebody, you need that that person needs assistance. Then some ways to ease disaster-related stress. Talk with the person about your feelings, even though it may be difficult, anger or sorrow. Seek help from professional counselors who deal with post-disaster stress. Don't hold yourself responsible for the disaster event or get frustrated because you cannot directly assist in the recovery work. Stay active in your daily routine to help promote your own physical and emotional healing, e.g. healthy eating, exercise, rest, relaxation. Spend time with family and friends. Then children's reactions. So the next one is children's reaction to disaster. Children show a remarkable resistance to disasters. Those affected, however, show temporary emotional upset manifested by insomnia, clinging to parents, dependency, and fear. So all these are signs that this person needs assistance. How to cope? This step can help keep the family together, avoid leaving the children alone. Give assurance by word and deed. Listen to what a child says about his or her fears. Encourage the child to talk about his or her reactions to disaster. Include children in cleaning up activities so that they can also have their own experience. Parents must control their own fears and seek professional help if one sleeping problem is prolonged, clinging behavior does not diminish, and fears become worse. Now, emergency sheltering. One of the realities of emergencies and disasters of all kinds is the, that people may be forced to leave their homes, firstly, because of the threat of the hazard impact, and secondly, their homes may have been destroyed or damaged extensively by the event. Shelter is a basic human need. In addition to water, food, health, and personal care, shelter is crucial to survival in an emergency disaster. In addition to survival, good shelter promotes the maintenance of health and safeguards the population from potential negative impacts of exposure to the physical environment. However, emergency shelters are not expected to become permanent homes for evacuated persons. Shelters are structurally sound buildings in safe locations that are designated in planning stages of disaster management programs. 
to house victims of emergency or disaster and to provide for their immediate needs. The period of occupation of these facilities is usually a very brief and brief one, extending not more than a few days, but may be lengthened depending on the severity of the impact. Now, sheltering in a national emergency should be your last resort. Persons should always make prior arrangement to seek shelter at a family or friend first. It will be much more comfortable. However, if you have to evacuate to a public shelter, you should follow the guidelines below. One, be aware of emergency shelter location. Hello, Farouk, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, due to some time constraints, sir, uh, I'll request you to, sir, kindly sum up in five minutes, sir. Yes, I'm about to. I'm almost, I only have about three slides okay. to go. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah, however, if you have to evacuate to a public shelter, you should follow this guideline, as I've said. Do not attempt to seek refuge in a shelter unless notified by authority that it has been officially opened. Listen to evacuation advice and leave promptly when advised by authorities to do so. Recognize that public shelter's primary function is to provide refuge that is roof over your head. Food and blankets may not always be available. Pets, weapons, alcohol, beverages, and narcotics will not be allowed in a shelter. Circumstances may also require ban on cigarette or cigar smoking. If, or, if at all possible, make arrangement to stay with a friend. It's even better or family. Wherever you go, take your provisions. Remember, you are not just a guest, but also a shelteree. Help others in the shelter in any way you can as a disaster manager. So before you leave for a shelter, be sure your family is well fed before you take them to home of any friend or shelter. Fill as many containers as possible with water and store in your refrigerator in your house. Shut off all water, electricity, gas uh, sources in your house before you go. Then lock windows and doors. Bring pets outside if you are to remain at home. Have plenty of newspaper for sanitary purposes. If you decide to evacuate, remember shelters will not take pets. If possible, ar make arrangements for your pets. Take small valuables and the following important papers like your travel, driver's license, and the rest. Shelter managers will not be responsible for the storage of your valuable items. Now, when you leave, leave early in a daylight if possible. Avoid already flooded areas. Do not attempt to cross any stretch of flood waters on foot if the water is above your knees. Do not drive where there is water on the road because the water, may be washed, the, the water must have washed the road away. Drive carefully. Do not travel further than necessary. Roads may be jammed or blocked. The next one is take extra precaution if you are told to evacuate at night. Night darkness hides the flood dangers. If you suddenly find yourself driving through flood waters and your car stops, get out immediately and climb to a higher ground. Stranded auto could become your own coffin, God forbid. When you have found a safe refuge, stay put. Many people have lost their lives trying to go from one place to another during disasters. Register each member of your group as soon as you enter the shelter. If conflicts arise within the shelter, it is the shelter manager that, that handles those issues. Remember, keeping the shelter facility clean and sanitary is everyone's business. Now, items to take to an emergency shelter. As I said, the shelter is not going to provide all those things for you. Pillows, blankets, sleeping bag, air mattresses, extra clothing, shoes, eyeglasses, etc folding chairs, lawn chairs, or course, personal hygiene items like toothpaste, toothbrush, deodorant, drunk, quiet games, books, playing cards, and favorite toys for your children, important papers, all your important documents, then portable radio and battery, flashlight, then 24-hour supply of food, non-perishable. Thank you very, very much, my respectable uh, uh, participants. This has brought me to the end of my lecture. Disaster preparedness. Well, it is everyone's business. We have to all be educated and be equipped with what to do. It's not that some people are wicked. I always say, lack the knowledge and the technical. Thank you very much once again. And this has brought me to the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Farooq, sir, for a wonderful presentation and enlightening us about the uh, specific needs and what community needs to do and how community needs to prepare whenever we are talking about community preparedness. And one thing is very clear from your presentation that uh, community-based disaster preparedness is a process of being people together 
within the same community so that they can enable themselves to collect, you know, collectively address a common disaster risk and to collectively pursue common disaster preparedness because throughout your presentation you have talked about the uh, togetherness and the importance of uh, working as a team and in collaboration and one more sir i think a very important point that you have also discussed is that uh, whenever we talk about community based disaster preparedness uh, which is a process that mobilizes a group of people in a systematic way towards achieving a safer and resilient community itself and um, in, in, and also it is very important that uh, you know when we are talking about uh, this community that equalize that power relations the uh, the different groups that you are talking about the importance of uh, including uh, the, uh, the you know disabled people the elderly people the children the young children that you talked about because whenever we are talking about uh, uh, leaving no one behind uh, as we talk about so all these points that you have raised are very, very important because uh, whenever we are making some plans at community level or whenever we are making some plan at the family level that you have highlighted, it is very important to highlight it, to highlight and to think about those people who are much, much more vulnerable um, as compared to a normal men, men, right? So thank you very much, sir, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, as of now, sir, uh, there are no questions. Uh, if there will be any questions, sir, I will let you know. So, uh, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, now, moving ahead uh, with uh, with our second presentation for the day, uh, we have been uh, joined by Dr. Harjit Kaur, uh, who is a young, uh, who is a um, junior consultant in an IDM, and uh, Ma'am will be talking about the uh, you know the preparedness of community, and for that. Uh, for any community, like sir said, it is very important to have a knowledge of the what are the risks that are prevailing in your community. So for that, you should we should be aware of the what are the risks that are there, what are the hazards that are uh, that are uh, that are associated with your community. So to enlighten us in more in detail, we uh, I will pass like to pass on the stage to Dr. Harjit Kaur to take up your session now. Uh, over to you, and uh, please, your the stage is yours. First of all, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Raju Thapaji, for uh, giving me this opportunity to present my view on the topic of risk knowledge for community preparedness. So I hope my PPT is visible to all. Yes, yes. Okay, sir. Thank you. So, uh, as you uh, today, my presentation topic is on uh, risk knowledge for community preparedness. So before starting the technical presentation, I would like to uh, share the coronavirus prevention measure as this is our mandate and duty. So to aware our dear participant to fight against COVID-19 pandemic as COVID-19 um, and it's a new variant Omicron is spreading in our community. So stay safe uh, by taking some simple precaution uh, such as physical distancing, wearing mask properly, clean uh, hands with soap and water. If water is not available, then please use alcohol based sanitizer and avoid uh, crowds uh, keeping room well ventilated so and they check the local advice where you live and work so do it all uh, as uh, our topic is for risk knowledge for community preparedness so you know communities are exposed and vulnerable to uh, disaster risk uh, from various hazard it may be uh, earthquake landslide flood cyclone so it is important that uh, community members themselves are aware of such risk and vulnerabilities and uh, one way to develop this understanding in the community is through the risk assessment uh, through risk mapping exercise to help and prioritize which hazard an early warning system will focus uh, on and guide the response preparedness uh, activities and uh, as, as well as disaster prevention. So uh, these assessment and mapping the 
exercise could be based on the communities, uh, different categories of vulnerability, like human, social, economic, environmental, and as well as their uh, previous experience with the natural hazard. As uh, our previous speaker uh, shared his uh, experience of uh, uh, community preparedness. So these awareness uh, raising session uh, that use the participatory methodology uh, that would be uh, the first step in developing a people center early warning system. And uh, at the end of the um, day, it is important that the community members themselves determine the risk to which they are most exposed and vulnerable. And that DRR implementers uh, concede that these may not match their own assessment of the situation. So uh, these images uh, showing a different type of hazard uh, in your community. It may be a flood, earthquake, forest fire are there, cyclone is there. So we need to focus for uh, uh, hazard in our particular area. So let's, uh, before uh, entering to a risk knowledge, we should uh, understand what is hazard, what is vulnerability, and how we can characterize an uh, event as a hazard. So hazard is a rare or an extreme natural or a human-made phenomena uh, that threatens to adversely affect the human life, property, or the activity to the extent of causing disaster. So uh, how you can characterize an event as hazard when an event may cause the loss of life, injury, or other health impact, property damage, uh, social and economic disruption, or the environmental degradation. And uh, these uh, event named as a hazard. So here, uh, sorry, I'm showing uh, one table, like uh, these uh, serial number wise I have mentioned, like measles, uh, e-waste, uh, thunderstorm, flood, landslide, and uh, violence. So how you can uh, characterize these event as a hazard? So first, we should develop knowledge to understand what is under the category of hazards, like measles, is it is a hazard? Then next question, if yes, then does it have uh, an impact on the functioning of the community? Are the proactive and reactive measures are available to manage these hazards? So we need to understand these things for a event. Like e-waste, electronic waste are not under the category of hazard. Thunderstorm, flood, landslide, these are under the category of hazard. Then, uh, as uh, in the previous, I have told that an event is characterized as hazard. So, hazard turns into a disaster when people uh, in the danger zone are vulnerable and don't have the uh, coping capacity, and it will create impact. So, then that hazard will known as disaster. From uh, image, we can easily understand these things. How? Just you can see in the figure A that a person is just uh, lies behind the uh, mountain and the boulder is uh, going down. So this person is vulnerable due to this boulder. In the next picture, you can see in the right side, that uh, the D, uh, C1, where a person, uh, that vulnerable person is died due to the uh, boulder slide down. So uh, it will create a disaster. So these things we need to understand. In the deep, just uh, below the uh, image C, you can see a house is vulnerable due to a uh, landslide. So uh, this way, we, uh, the community person need to understand which uh, areas are vulnerable. So uh, basically, uh, the natural hazard is classified into five categories. 
even in the table I have showed uh, you the measles that is under the category of biological hazards. This uh, COVID-19 is also under the category of biological hazard. Similarly, there is a geophysical hazards, hydrological hazard, climatological hazard, and metrological hazards. So these are the different categories. So uh, again, uh, the disaster is defined by our high power committee. So here they have classified the disaster into a five category. Uh, water and climate related uh, disaster like flood, cyclone, hailstorm, cloud burst, heat wave, cold wave, drought, sea erosion, thunderstorm, and tsunamis. These are under the category of water and climate related disaster. Then uh, landslides, earthquake, dam failure, dam burst, and mine fire. Uh, sorry, mine fires are under the category of geological related disasters. And then the CBRN nuclear disaster under the category of chemical industrial and nuclear disaster. Fourth category is our biological disaster. Here they have uh, subcategorized the paste attack, cattle epidemics, and food poisonings under the biological related disaster. And in the fifth category, they have uh, classified the accident related disaster. So these are the forest fire, uh, urban fires, and mine flooding. Oil spill is also under the category of accidental. Then um, the standard definition of uh, disaster is a serious disruption of the functioning of a community or a society involving a widespread human material, economic or the environmental losses and impacts which exceed the ability of the uh, affected community or a society to cope, in, uh, cope using its yeah. own resources. And according to the DM Act 2005, disaster means a catastrophe or mishap, calamity, or a grave occurrences in any area arising from natural or uh, man-made cause or by accident or a negligence which result in a substantially loss of life or a human suffering or a damage uh, and destruction uh, of uh, property, damage or degradation of envi environment and is uh, such a nature or a magnitude as to be beyond its coping capacity of the community of the affected area. So uh, primarily disasters are triggered by the natural hazards or a human induced or a result uh, from a combination of the both. And the widely accepted classification system used by uh, the disaster information management system uh, is arising from the natural hazard into a five categories. So they have categorized uh, like a geophysical hazard, similarly that I have al already discussed with you. So uh, high power committee also uh, added one more thing that is human induced disaster. Here uh, they have classified the CBRN hazards and fire under the category of uh, CBRN that is the chemical, biological, radiological and nuclear disaster. Uh, then uh, level of disaster classified under uh, the NDMP 2016 where they have uh, classified disaster into uh, three categories, level one, two, and three, and level zero. Then uh, here, uh, the disaster uh, management and its planning at uh, various tire must uh, take into account the vulnerability of a disaster affected areas and the capacity of the authorities to deal with the situation. So using uh, this approach, the high power uh, committee uh, uh, Categorize the disaster situations into the three levels L1, L2, and L3. So, where the L0 uh, indicates the period of normalcy that should be utilized for the disaster risk reduction. So, the L1, that is the level of disaster that can be managed within the capabilities and resources at the district level. So, but um, the state authorities will remain in readiness to provide the assistance if needed. Then level two, 
which signifies the disaster situation that require assistance and activity uh, sorry active mobilization of resources at the state level and deployment of the state level agencies for the disaster management so here the central agency must remain vigilant for the immediate deployment if required by the state then level 3 which correspond to a nearly catastrophic situations or a, a very large scale disaster that overwhelms the state and district authorities. So the categorization of disaster situation is into the level zero to level three. So this situation is not mentioned in our DM Act 2005. Then um, this is all about the disaster and uh, their situations, their level. Uh, now, we were going to discuss about uh, the vulnerability after the hazard. So vulnerability is uh, defined as the degree of loss to a given element at risk resulting from the occurrences of a natural phenomena or uh, through uh, anthropogenic activities uh, within a given magnitude. So vulnerability is expressed uh, from the scale 0 to 1. 0 means uh, lower vulnerable and 1 indicates the higher vulnerability. So uh, from uh, this uh, map, you are able to uh, classify the hazard risk. So from how you can classify, like for um, uh, you can take an example of a coastal area. So here uh, the earthquake is uh, uh, that coastal area is not falls under the uh, seismic city zone. Then fire is uh, the high risk under the uh, coastal areas then building collapse is also under the high risk so that in this way we need to uh, classify the map of particular area then how we can um, uh, assess the vulnerability so we can assess vulnerability with two simple questions who are at risk that is our population that I have already shown you in the image that that person and the uh, house structure, house that is vulnerable to do a landslide. Then what is at risk? That is infrastructure. So with these two simple questions, we are easily to assess the vulnerability with uh, for any geographical area. So uh, different scientists or researchers used uh, different types of vulnerability. So mostly researchers used a type of vulnerability is physical vulnerability, social, economic, and political vulnerability. So physical vulnerabilities are infrastructure, buildings, uh, lifelines. These are under the category of physical vulnerability. Then social vulnerabilities are population, economic vulnerability, like uh, the structures that uh, are more expensive. Uh, these are under the category of economic uh, vulnerability and political vulnerability. Suppose if we are living in uh, Delhi and uh, this is the capital of our country and here the mostly our Rajya Sabha, all the political activities, uh, their main hubs are there, headquarters are there. So if suppose um, earthquake occurred as uh, um, Delhi is under the uh, seismic zone 4, so it will obviously damage these uh, buildings. So it will create a political vulnerability. So we need to prepare the political vulnerability map for the particular area. Then uh, uh, what is uh, capacity? So capacity is the combination of all these strength, attributes and resources available within an organization or a community or a society to manage and reduce the disaster risk and strengthen the resilience. So within uh, one word, we can define its uh, DRM uh, capacity as ability of coping and uh, responding to reduce the loss. Then uh, after uh, uh, vulnerability, hope uh, everyone have a clear uh, the thoughts about the uh, hazard and vulnerability so now we are going entering into a risk so we first we need to uh, identify the specific risk specific risk for a particular hazard so here it means uh, identify a risk for a particular hazard at a specific geographical region so uh, suppose we are uh, focusing uh, for a coastal uh, disaster risk reduction so here we need to focus only for the coastal hazard that are uh, a cyclone, uh, even uh, landslides, floods are there. So we need to focus for the coastal hazard only if we are uh, talking about the specific risk. 
then um, we need to identify element at risk. So element at risk, what are element at risk? So the population properties, economic activities, including the public uh, services, etc. These are at risk of a given area. So from this image, we are uh, able to distinguish the element at risk for a coastal area from this is the satellite image so you can easily see this is the harbor area and this satellite imagery i have pointed out this is the airport area and this is uh, the uh, plant crop plantations are there agricultural land or uh, population is residing there so the if cyclone hit this uh, area so it these population infrastructure is vulnerable due to uh, cyclone. So we need to prepare the map for the uh, element at risk for the cyclone hazard. So then uh, this is the similar uh, picture uh, for the cyclone area and uh, you can see like a community is uh, living in the coastal area. So mostly in the coastal areas, these are uh, village areas of uh, uh, fishermen colony, you can say. So uh, if cyclone occurs, they, so, uh, the fishermen uh, houses were damaged. Even their cattle, livestock, these are damaged due to the cyclone. So we need to think to prepare the risk map, vulnerability map for the a particular area, vulnerable area. Then how ca we can do a risk analysis? So basically we can define risk, which means the identification of undesired events. Undesired events are like a hazard. Now that it may be a cyclone, it may be a landslide. So these analysis of mechanism by which these undesired event could occur. And usually the estimation of the extent, magnitude and the likelihood of any harmful effects. So this is about the risk analysis. Like uh, in the previous image, I have shown that this is the fisherman colonies and these are vulnerable due to a land, uh, due to a uh, cyclone. So we need to prepare the uh, cyclone hazard map and the risk map for the community. Then uh, response, what is uh, response? So uh, according to the DM Act, Response uh, is defined as the taking of appropriate measures to respond an event. It may be a natural uh, hazard or a man made hazard. So, including the action taken and measured plans in anticipation of during and immediately after an event to ensure that its effects are minimized and that person affected by the event are uh, given immediate relief and support. So uh, the main aim of response operation is to uh, save life, properties, uh, protect the properties and make an affected area safe. So accordingly, response is the operationalization and implementation of plan and process and the organization of activities to respond to an event and its aftermath. Then recovery. Recovery is an organization methods of regaining access and functionality to its uh, structure after events like a, a flood, landslide or earthquake. So we can say this is uh, recovery is the build back better. So uh, this is uh, uh, now the preparedness. So preparedness refers to measures taken to prepare for uh, and reduce the effect of the disaster like this uh, training program is also the part of the preparedness. So for a community, I would suggest ki first you need to identify the risk surrounding your areas. This is the first step if you are uh, 
going for the disaster preparedness. So, uh, which of these uh, means uh, like uh, any hazards that we have discussed? If these uh, hazards threaten to our society or not? So, uh, this is our India map from where you can see uh, that how a different uh, disaster impact on our country. Like uh, as we have the coastal states, we have the hill area, we have the riverine states. So, obviously, a different uh, part of our country is uh, suffering with a different type of hazards. So, uh, that I have already discussed. So, recommendation from my presentation is we need to improve the understanding of disaster uh, has a uh, disaster. It's definitions, hazard, vulnerability, and risk. And we need to provide uh, means community should know the uh, clarity about these terminologies and their roles and responsibilities if any event hit their area. And uh, people must be educated about the dangers and how to minimize uh, them. And so uh, this is all about uh, the recommendation from my presentation and uh, thank you very much back to you mr thapa and thank you uh, thank you dr harjit kaur for your wonderful uh, presentation and talking about the importance of uh, risk uh, particularly risk knowledge whenever we are talking about uh, community and community preparedness uh, uh, particularly the the community based preparedness that you have focused about so we we need to understand that and the will and the points like the capacity you have talked about the preparedness you have talked about the response you have talked about so all that points are definitely important and until and unless like you mentioned during your presentation that until and unless we know what the what are the problems what are the risks that are prevailing in a particular area it will be very difficult to move on with the uh, other other important uh, steps that uh, that that can, that follows the risk knowledge, particularly monitoring the uh, the and also the preparedness. All that won't be possible. So uh, thank you very much for giving a detailed presentation on uh, what are the steps that needs to be taken, what are the preparedness at community level that we can do. Uh, so your presentation was very fruitful and very important. So um, since there are particularly no questions, uh, I will I will get back to you if there will be uh, any any questions later on. So uh, for the third presentation, uh, let me let me share my presentation. I will be very quick. So I will be talking about uh, the whole theme of the webinar, particularly that is a community based uh, early warning system, and I will be talking about what are the why we have to understand um, this whole concept of community based early warning system so uh, but before that because in in any early warning system it, it is it won't be right to directly jump on to the topic so uh, now we have some uh, backup ideas about what is uh, what are the community preparedness that Paduk sir talked about now we also have knowledge of risk knowledge that dr harjit kaur has talked about now let us try to understand the importance of um, early warning system particularly community based early warning system but before that uh, like uh, dr harjit kaur also mentioned it is very important that we understand the situation now the omicron virus that is um, when the covid cases are continuously increasing in india uh, there are uh, restrictions also in some places so all that we have to understand and uh, as in as in uh, sensible citizen we have to do our part and we have to follow all the respiratory etiquettes uh, whether you are that is the physical distancing or using a face mask regular hand washing uh, coverings one mouth or uh, other respiratory etiquette self monitoring of health and also getting vaccinated as soon as possible if you are not vaccinated already so all that needs to be done uh, I will just uh, cut short to the directly to a topic that uh, particularly in this uh, COVID-19 scenario, I think all of us has felt that uh, people, uh, particularly in Asia and Asia Pacific region, uh, because uh, they are in Asia, you know, they are highly prone to disasters. Uh, they have been affected by several earthquakes, several cyclones. So with even uh, Professor Surya Prakash was talking in the inaugural address and other exceptional events. 
And uh, during this uh, time, particularly this in COVID-19, we have to understand that uh, there was a new concept of whole this disaster health climate nexus because we were facing the mixture of both disasters in combination with um, the climate uh, nexus, uh, particularly health, COVID-19 and cyclone, COVID-19 and flood, right? So we have to understand and we have to address this the, the disaster health climate nexus in order to achieve the sustainable development goals that India is also a signatory and uh, other countries are all making in constant efforts. But we cannot deny the fact that uh, there, the, there is a shifting, uh, shifting contours, uh, particularly when you're talking about disasters uh, and disaster management, uh, particularly in Asia Pacific disaster, uh, you know, risk scale. And over the past two decades, if you will see countries in Asia and the Pacific has made significant progress uh, in achieving the sustainable development goal. but there are still uh, things that needs to be worked on and and to uh, and there are still uh, you know uh, some areas which have been left behind and to promote good health and well-being is very important so we need to work on such issues also and uh, this covid-19 pandemic uh, you know it has uh, harshly demonstrated the global spread and uh, you know our our weaknesses particularly when we are talking about multi hazard early warning system we are not uh, sometimes um, we are not uh, prepared to uh, face the cascading effects of disasters, multi hazards. So we have to look upon that also, and and as a community, as the you know the ground pillar where the, in the community we have to be prepared at least you know to the best of our capability so that uh, we can face some disasters at our own before the help arises from outside. And this uh, when this COVID nineteen pandemic was raised, was going on, the regions continue to experience other natural hazards, like I said. So uh, it is not only India, you talk about Afghanistan, Australia, Bangladesh, you know, name any country, everywhere uh, during COVID-19, we were having disasters in, um, uh, you know, in, uh, in Pakistan, in Philippines, Typhoon Goni was there. And in that Typhoon Goni, the COVID-19 laboratory was uh, destroyed because of that the COVID-19 testing was suspended and which resulted in higher spreading of COVID cases. And in India also, you talk about the cyclone Amphan where uh, several primary health centers were destroyed, or you talk about the, uh, the flood in Assam uh, during that time, because when people were shifted to a relief camp during that time um, uh, in flood in 2020, uh, because of that COVID-19 uh, uh, restrictions and COVID-19 uh, spread of COVID-19, uh, around 1,200 new cases were reported in one day. And during that time, that was the highest reported case. So you can understand how uh, this cascading and how the multi-hazard concepts uh, is, is an important issue that needs to be, you know, look upon very seriously and we need to take actions uh, towards that. And this this whole concept of this uh, multi hazard early warning system or early warning system in particular, it is not something that uh, only we are talking about. This is something which has been recognized by the all the nations uh, around the globe, and it has been presented. It, in, it has been talked about in uh, in whether it is the um, Paris Agreement or is the Sustainable Development SDGs, the SFDR Sendai Framework, or the PM 10 point agenda in India particularly where uh, Sri Narendra Modi ji has laid down 10 point mantras to work um, for enhancing our disaster res resilience. And like the, Dr. Harjit Kaur said, uh, India is vulnerable to a large number of disaster, but the important thing is we have to understand the need for disaster risk reduction and resilience, and it can be only done and uh, you know, with our preparedness, enhancing our preparedness, enhancing our knowledge, and also with the implementing the early warning strategies which are the set of measures taken to increase our resilience. And if correctly implemented, early warning system can help to reduce the losses uh, and of lives and property, and also to minimize the environmental damage, which even our Farooq sir was talking about in his uh, earlier presentation. So basically, like I said, we need early warning system uh, to, so that we can save the life, the all important life of uh, the, our citizen, our people in the community, and also, uh, to safeguard the uh, you know infrastructure that we have so that is very important uh, and in any early warning system when we talk about whether it is the community based early warning system or uh, or other early warning systems uh, the basic four components that that constitute an uh, um, uh, community based early warning system are uh, risk knowledge which just now dr hajib kaur 
it has a discuss in detail and uh, the second component is the monitoring and warning services the third is the dissemination and communication and the fourth is the response capacity so Dix knowledge, uh, like Nam said, is a combination of hazards and vulnerabilities at a particular location. And for this region, risk knowledge is very, very important to understand. Uh, and uh, I won't be talking in detail because we have already understood. But I just want to say that uh, one line that um, until and unless you know the risks that are prevailing in your area, you cannot take appropriate measures. So we have to be very well versed with the risk that are prevailing in our area, in our community, and what could be the solutions. Uh, at least we should have some talking points. What are the risks that might arise and what are the compounding risks? And suppose in case of earthquake, sometimes we have landslide which are triggered by earthquake, right? Similarly, in, in coastal areas so with cyclone, we have some storm surges which resulted in, in flooding of the entire area. So all this concept and, and uh, this uh, multi hazard concept, we have to think in our planning um, uh, and, we, and while addressing also. And the second point is, uh, is uh, definitely the monitoring and warning services here. Basically, what we do is we monitoring, we monitor uh, the, um, you know, the data or we monitor the, uh, the hazards that that are prevailing in our area. Suppose uh, if you want, if you are uh, residing in uh, the hilly area, suppose, uh, if you want to check uh, whether, uh, you know, uh, what are the um, landslides, maybe one parameter will be rainfall because uh, rainfall triggered landslides are, are very common and uh, they are largely talked about. So maybe you will, you will measure rainfall, right? So you will, you will be measuring that rainfall and you will be uh, with the help of rain gauge or anything. So that type of thing is called monitoring. We'll talk about earthquake. If you want to measure the earthquake, you will be measuring the seismic waves, right? So all that needs to be done in monitoring and warning services, and uh, and we for that we have to use, we have to be use the state of the art. We have to be you know one step ahead, so that if we have the best technology for available, uh, so that we are always you know ahead of the time, and we can make even you know contributions of saving even little time, so that. Uh, even if you have a, uh, that very crucial information just before time, if, if you can get that information even one hour before, that, that can be a very important you know, uh, contribution. So we have to constantly look our, towards uh, advancing our monitoring and warning service, uh, services. And that can be done with the advancement of, you know, with the use of satellite technology that we have, the remote sensing and GIS we talked about. All that can be a very important tool. Apart from that, the land-based radars, the Doppler radar we talked about, the automatic weather stations, all that can also be used in addition to the satellite technology. And also on-ground points are also very important, particularly when we talk about, suppose, a flood, when you are measuring flood in riverine, riverine flood in that type of situation, if you're uh, um, up, up, you know, upstream stations, they measure the water level in that point, that type of point to measurement are sometimes very, very important in case of uh, even earthquake also, when you measure the S wave and the P wave, right, all that point measurement are also sometimes very, very important. And uh, we need to have the expertise also to understand all that information and come out with an inter uh, with an um, um, interpretation or with an warning that will that needs to be disseminated further and the importance of dissemination of warnings was also highlighted by uh, Farooq sir in his first presentation and uh, the dissemination the whatever we are talking about it needs to be you know very clear whenever we are talking about community because we have to understand to whom we are dealing uh, dealing with right when you are dealing with the community we have to be very sure, sure that the community knows where to look for information. The communities are well prepared. Uh, how uh, like the information, the what they are getting, and how to process that information, that needs to be done beforehand. Before uh, that, that is in our preparedness strategy. And during disaster, the warning and disseminations to various users it, uh, that that can be transmitted through radio or the television, social media. Now with the advancement of mobile technology, I think social media is becoming the one of the most preferred media for transmitting the warnings. Now even our um, nodal agencies also have their own apps or, or dedicated apps for each disaster. Like we have Damni app, we have Make app, right? So 
uh, that that needs to be done. Apart from that, even the siren or speakers in in community can be a very important. Uh, the community speakers sometimes the marriage hall speaker that can also be used in in times of disaster and community radio also because the ham radio community radio they also has a very significant role to play and in if you ask my perspective i think every hospitals every critical infrastructure buildings that we have they they need they they need to have some or at least one person ham radio expert so that in times of disasters, in times of emergency, they can play a very important role in establishing the communications, immediate communications, because sometimes just immediate after disaster, you will see that the communications are, are you know, disturbed and, the, the, and to establish that communication, we need to have some ham expert. So if you have your uh, you know, own ham expert in particularly in important crit uh, critical infrastructure, so there won't be any breakage of information so that um, the immediate help, immediate relief can be received and immediate uh, the uh, you know, assistance and other things can be received from the uh, other, other areas. And uh, these information that are transferred uh, from the uh, nodal agencies or me measurement or in your own community, if you have your monitoring monitoring stations based somewhere, that information needs to be, suppose, uh, let's take an example of flood, the upstream and the down, let us take the example of upstream and downstream. So whatever, uh, suppose in upstream, you have measured some, uh, you know, flood high, chances of flood, the water level is uh, rising. That information needs to be transmitted immediately to the downstream, and that information should be very clear, like um, what is going to happen, when it is going to happen, or how it is going to happen, or at least whom to contact, how to contact, where should they go, what is the uh, you know uh, 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 contact points, whom to contact, right? What is the uh, you know uh, the uh, point where they should evacuate? All that information needs to be shared, and the community they needs to be prepare beforehand. That's why the last component comes into play and is a very important component in any early warning system is the response capacity. Because uh, we, we need to prepare ourselves to response to disaster and uh, that can be done only through regular, uh, you know, interactions in community, whether through mock drills or regular uh, having meetings among the community or at the family level, like Farooq sir was saying. So all that needs to be done. And also we need to have a very effective plan and uh, that that will be discussed later on with, uh, by our next presenter, and and it is also very uh, important that uh, you know we'll, whenever we are talking about uh, response capacity, we need to be well prepared from advance so that in case of any warning uh, signals that are being disseminated by the um, monitoring stations, that the community needs to understand that message and they need to act very promptly because all disasters don't come with um, uh, lead time, that much lead time. Suppose if in case of flood, if, uh, if your monitoring station is uh, not that uh, far away from your first community, the the monitoring, as soon as the monitoring station will measure that that information that the time that it takes to transmit from the upstream to the downstream, it might be maybe one hour or two hours. So the community needs to make all the actions uh, within that time so that they can evacuate themselves, they can evacuate their livestock, and they can evacuate their cave, uh, safely take care of their uh, belongings, important belongings. So all that needs to be taken care of. So in short, I will say that uh, for an effective uh, early warning system, uh, an effective end-to-end -end people center early warning system, we need to have all this, uh, you know, integration of all these four key elements. So that is disaster risk knowledge based on systematic collection of data and disaster risk assessment. The second is the uh, detail, uh, det uh, you know, detection, monitoring, or uh, analyzing and forecasting of the hazards and possible consequences. The third is the dissemination of that warning, whatever you have done through monitoring by an official source or an authentic source in a very timely and accurate and actionable warning. And, all, and all, of course, the fourth one is the preparedness at all level, whether that is the community level or, uh, or a small area level or it, even at a uh, you know, family level, like, uh, like our earlier speaker was saying, so that we can respond to the warning that has been received from the community. And we have to understand one fact that failure in any one of the component or a lack of coordination across them could lead to the failure of the whole system. And uh, whenever 
So whenever we are talking about, so just to give you an example of community-based flood early warning system, whenever we are talking about flood, a community-based flood early warning system, the, um, uh, the four important features could be, it, it must be very cost effective because the manufacturing, repairing and maintenance of the system uh, cannot, yeah, so that it can be done by at the community level, at the local level. So it has to be very cost effective. It needs to be people-centered. What I mean to say by people-centered is that, the community member and the government line agencies uh, take ownership of the system and are involved in managing and disseminating early warning information. And the third point is the uh, near uh, near uh, real time information. Uh, as water level you know rises upstream, uh, communities they disseminate uh, near real time information to vulnerable downstream communities. And the response mechanism when we are talking about response mechanism that. Uh, the training and uh, awareness activities enhancing community response to early warnings and providing them lead time for preparedness. And uh, information flow also, uh, you know, disseminating and communicating uh, the risk information to the concerned communities and authorities is an integral part of this uh, community based flood early warning system. Uh, when the flood signal is uh, detected upstream, like I said, it needs to be disseminated instantly so that people can prepare and respond to it in the downstream. And warning information must be very clear and very brief, like I said earlier. So, uh, based on that, what you can understand, I suppose, with this uh, picture that you are seeing, when rainfall and water level rises, station send data. So, the st st station is uh, station is sending data, and the technical person it re they receive the data and they interpret it. And that, 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 that it is the role of the technical person or it is the duty of the technical person to receive that data, to understand that data, and he translate it into a simple message that can be easily sent via mobile phone or any other means available to the community. And, the, it, and after receiving the, uh, you know, the information, after receiving the warning from the technical person, the community, the volunteers or other people who are working on the ground, uh, those volunteers of flood early warning community, they can now react and help other community member save their life by see, by going to an elevated area. I hope uh, this was helpful. So uh, I will just skip that. So uh, what in the end I would like to say is that, uh, you know, uh, in today's world, you don't have to be a disaster expert to make a difference. Like uh, Farooq sir was saying, it is everyone business now. And whenever you are aware, like whether you are a scientist, you know, or uh, whether you are a politician or whether you are a concerned citizen, you all can better understand our risk and make step to enhance our resilience right at the community level, which is very, very important. So after that only uh, we can imagine or we can think of a disaster free country or a disaster free nations. This is the whole motive of our concern. And I would like to end my presentation saying that disaster risk reduction, uh, you know, is the key to sustainable development and climate change adaptation. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, let me see if there are any questions or I can take uh, some questions later on. Uh, but uh, just before taking question, I would like to pass on the stage to our uh, next speaker, let's uh, Sri Anil Kathet, who is the junior consultant in NIDM. Uh, sir, over to you uh, for your, for your, uh, for your speech, sir. Uh, thank you very, very much, Dr. Thapa. I hope I am audible to you. Yes, sir. Okay. So once again, uh, thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon to all the participants and other panelists who are who are uh, with us. So uh, today I will be talking about uh, people uh, community centric uh, landslide early warning system. As you know, uh, landslides are one of the major hydrogeological hazards that. Uh, affects a large part of India, whether uh, you can take from my three Himalayan range in north to the coastal areas of our uh, south. And uh, India being the uh, seventh largest country in the world, appropriate of the area, is persistently knocked down by landslides of varied magnitude uh, throughout the history. And uh, when you see the history of landslides in India, it uh, way back to uh, 18th century. A geological Survey of India, which is uh, the nodal agency for landslide study as well as management in the country, according to the, uh, that uh, agency, about 12.6% uh, of total area of our landmass is vulnerable to different kinds 
uh, different magnitude of uh, landslide hazards and this uh, vulnerable areas spares over 19 odd states and four uh, union territories all the northern himalayan states all the uh, northern um, himalayan union territories and then there are uh, seven sister states of our northeast parts um, as well as um, madhya pradesh chhattisgarh uh, towards uh, if you look uh, the states like Kerala, Karnataka, Maharashtra, they are also suffering uh, from landslides uh, hazards. And in any disaster situation, the local people, the local community is most affected one. As well as uh, they are also the first uh, responder uh, until unless any external response is provided to them. So this is uh, also the fact that community know their area better uh, than any uh, external persons. So we need to, uh, incorporate uh, the knowledge of uh, this uh, indigenous local knowledge in our every uh, deployment planning and process. Uh, I will uh, share a small uh, uh, incidence of uh, how uh, uh, local community knows uh, better uh, uh, their area than others. Uh, there was an incidence in uh, Kodrubi landslide uh, that is in Himachal Pradesh and this incidence was uh, occurred in uh, year 2017. Uh, this was the uh, major landslide uh, that uh, first of uh, its kind in that uh, Mandi districts of Himachal Pradesh and uh, the disaster engulfed more than uh, 46 human lives uh, besides uh, livestock, agriculture, land and major portion of the national highway. And uh, during our uh, field visit, we talked uh, to the local administration, we talked the local people, uh, local villagers of the affected area. And according to them, the landslide was first initiated uh, in year 1977 and that too in the uh, month of August. But at that time, th uh, there was no casualty. Again, after a leap of 20 years, in again in uh, month of August, but uh, the, now the year is 1997, um, the, this um, landslide was reactivated second time. So uh, basically, the local community was well aware about uh, that the slope is unstable at that particular uh, point. And as a precautionary measures, uh, the villagers used to have in the area at the night, uh, especially during the monsoon season. So uh, this was that uh, local people are well aware uh, about uh, the scenario, about uh, the uh, what uh, how, what um, hazards was uh, risk are there in particular area. So. Uh, we need uh, to in incorporate uh, their the local knowledge, uh, whatever the deployment uh, activities, uh, construction activities, or deployment plans we are planning on the fragile uh, slopes. So uh, now coming to the um, people-centric uh, uh, landslide warning system, uh, I will uh, share uh, provide insights on uh, the people-centric landslide warning system that uh, that was established by Geological Survey for India. Uh, in year nine, in year 20, uh, 2018, uh, in the Darjeeling district of West Bengal, <clears throat> basically the people centric land land early warning system is an early warning uh, setup where uh, the local people, the community, uh, plays an important role in management of uh, landslide warnings. And for us, successful implementation of any warning system, uh, there are four uh, interrelated key elements: uh, risk knowledge. Then there is uh, monitoring and analysis and uh, warning generation. Third uh, point is about uh, dissemination of that uh, warnings or so, uh, communication of warnings. And uh, fourth point is regarding the preparedness uh, for timely response and uh, timely response. Uh, and that should be in a sync of all uh, times and across all the sectors to function uh, fruitfully. So, now, basically, in people-centric uh, landslide early warning system, the community is in uh, charge of all the four interconnected core uh, pieces that make up an uh, efficient early warning system. And for uh, generating warnings, uh, uh, the system that was established uh, in uh, Darjeeling District, a uh, rainfall threshold model was used, as well as uh, the local landslide uh, risk uh, knowledge was also integrated with the rainfall threshold uh, model and the community keeps an eye on the rainfall. Uh, they analyze its threshold value and in case of when the uh, threshold value exceeds, uh, they issue warnings, they inform the uh, local community, uh, local administration, block administration and, as, uh, and such, uh, accordingly they 
uh, decide their you know, future decisions. So, the basic uh, operating procedure of that established uh, people-centric uh, uh, landslide warning system, it mainly uh, con it concerns mainly uh, syncing the, all the four elements of early warning um, system, like uh, risk and early, like um, monitoring and early warning services, then dissemination, communication, and in the end, response and uh, capability. And uh, in this uh, early warning system, the key players, they can be the members from Gram Panchaya, they can be uh, block level officers or district disaster management uh, officers from the district disaster management centers. Basically, uh, the local people uh, will be uh, included in that uh, communication centers and uh, risk knowledge. Risk knowledge is the utmost part of um, that uh, people centric early warning system. And community should be aware of uh, the landslide, uh, what kind of landslide is in their uh, area, what is the intensity of uh, such incidences. And we also need to teach uh, them about the landslide hazard scenario in and around their area. And um, regarding uh, this uh, monitoring analysis and warning purpose, uh, community resource person such as uh, Gram Panchayat employees, it, uh, it should be chosen and it should be uh, interested with measuring daily uh, rainfall at uh, predetermined intervals and relaying this information uh, uh, to the local uh, officials and uh, the in charge, it's, uh, the person who is the in charge of uh, this morning, uh, monitoring analysis and warning, uh, he should also uh, it must ensure that the warning information is disseminated uh, to all um, parties that are involved uh, in the timely manner, uh, uh, particularly to those who are um, at danger. Uh, and for this, they can also conduct a mock drill uh, send, uh, to send a warning and how after the receiving the warning, they, the local people uh, will um, take the action. So this will, uh, mock drill uh, will, uh, conducting a mock drill will uh, better synchronize the, uh, their activities as soon as they will be receiving the uh, any early warning or um, any alarming uh, from uh, that part particular person who is in charge of uh, sharing the warnings or alarms and it is uh, critical that the person uh, in charge keep the community at risk and informed uh, uh, them regular at regular in intervals and the uh, this uh, when, uh, when the rainfall stops and falls beyond uh, the alert threshold value all stakeholders must be notified when a reasonable amount of time has passed within the message that uh, alert uh, landslide warning withdrawn and for a timely response uh, preparedness is key we need to prepare, we need to practice uh, whatever the state and uh, operating procedure is uh, developed uh, so that at the time of actual incidents, at the time of actual uh, crisis situation, we can respond timely and we can respond effectively. So, uh, company must be aware of uh, their HRs, uh, that, um, uh, this, uh, warning systems and how uh, and know how to respond uh, timely. and. For that, uh, like I mentioned, all the stimulated drill uh, can be conducted to ensure uh, um, they effectively uh, respond during uh, these uh, emergency situations. So, such a uh, people centric or uh, you can say community based landslide early warning system, it will empower uh, the local villagers, local people to make decisions, allowing them to take actions at the appropriate time uh, so that uh, they, uh, we can save lives, so we can save uh, our. Uh, lives of our livestock and members of the community uh, who are living in the landslide prone areas, they can use this uh, simple uh, people-centric landslide early warning uh, system, um, this uh, low cost technology to apply to analyze the rainfall uh, data. As you know, the basic element of which trigger the landslides in our country is uh, the water, the rainfall water, uh, especially in the monsoon season. So it will lessen the danger of landslide in the geographical region. And as well as uh, when you see the eighth point of the, uh, our own river, Prime um, Minister 10 point agenda on disaster risk um, management, he also highlighted that we need to build on local capacities. You know, we need to build on, on local initiatives and uh, people should be trained. Uh, they should be trained uh, when, what, and how uh, they should respond to minimize uh, the risk of disaster neurons. So uh, with this, I will conclude and uh, over to you, Dr. Thapa.
Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for, for enlightening our participant to, with a uh, detailed information about the, the people-centered landslide early warning system. And like you, right, you rightly said that, sir, the, the engagement of the community uh, in the landslide, uh, whenever we're talking about a landslide and the people-centered uh, early warning system, the community has a very important role to play, and it is their engagement which will only make it more successful. Uh, thank you very much, sir. So uh, now moving quickly to our uh, valedictory session, but before valedictory session, there are two questions that has been uh, put up. Uh, uh, Faruk sir, are you there? Ambassador, I am. I'm. I'm here, sir. I'm here, sir. Okay, okay. So there is one question for you. Uh, uh, the question is, sir. Uh, during your presentation, sir, you have been talking. You have talked about various um, steps that can be taken right from preparatory steps. The the what what we can do in preparedness, what we can do in after disaster, uh, pre disaster, post disaster. So the participant wants to know, sir. Uh, the the name is uh, Adamu. Uh, since uh, like uh, the points that you have measured uh, were. That were particularly for any one disaster, or that uh, that were uh, for all the disaster in general, because uh, the question is like they want to say that sir, some disaster may differ from others, uh, so that's why they were uh, asking this question. But uh, I, what I personally think is that sir, that your point were very general and it was for all the disasters. But sir, we would like to hear your points. Sir. Thank you very very much, sir. Um. So I have answered it, but the truth about it, if you look at my area of concentration, we talk about community disaster preparedness. So it is not for any specific uh, disaster, but the general preparedness of a whole community in order to combat any type of disaster that may arise. Despite the fact during my lectures, I think I gave two examples like on flooding, when I said you should not drive in flood waters, and I also mentioned hurricane when I talk about tips for the uh, fishermen and the boars. But my context of this lecture is general preparedness. Because when it strikes, like, like this community we are on now, we are from various uh, parts of this world. The disaster that may manifest in your place is different from the one that will manifest from my place. So the, my concept is general knowledge on what to know, to knowledge of what to do in case of any type of disaster that may strike. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for wonderfully explaining again and uh, and highlighting uh, that the, it was for uh, general i hope uh, adamu your your query has been resolved uh, there is one more question uh, from uh, aditi raj uh, she wants to know why uh, can you please explain uh, vulnerability once again uh, i think dr hajikar has wonderfully explained this one but i will just like to add just one more simple points uh, that uh, you know vulnerability is nothing like ma'am said it's the extent of uh, or you know the degree to which an individual and when we are talking about communities or any other structures uh, are they likely to be damaged or disrupted for just for an example i will give you suppose a family who is living on the river bank okay it is more vulnerable to a uh, to flood right a particular uh, disaster flood as compared to a family who is uh, residing very far away from that uh, flood plain area Similarly, take an example of uh, uh, one more example in hilly areas. Uh, a family who is residing on a very steep slope in in hilly area, he is more prone to landslide as compared to a family who is uh, residing in particularly in more stable ground. So this is a vulnerability is nothing. It is just an extent or degree to which an individual or a community is is likely to be damaged in any particular disasters. So uh, that was uh, all the questions we have. And if you have any questions, do feel free to raise your questions later on also. Uh, I think you have received a mail from my email ID also regarding this program. You can uh, email me back with your questions. Uh, we will send it to the speakers and get your doubt cleared uh, even after this webinar also. So thank you very much for joining everybody. But uh, now moving on to the valedictory session, uh, I would like to request uh, 
our you know partners and also Arup Dharji, Sri Arup Dharji, who is the senior community disaster response volunteer from all Tripura Disaster Response Volunteer Association, to kindly say a few words and also share his knowledge or his his words uh, in the validity session. Sir, if you can hear me, uh, over to you. My audible, uh, Raju sir. Yes, yes, you are fine, and you are finally audible, sir. Okay, so. It has been long uh, enlightening session uh, today. I am uh, very much uh, pleased today that uh, despite of all our effort that went uh, very successes, uh, uh, the conversation also, it was not on the one man side, it was from the both, both side. Uh, we hope we, we had made best of our efforts for uh, conducting this webinar. And I take up my uh, humble uh, submission to Major General uh, Manoj Kumar Bindal, sir, ED and IDM, for providing us the effort for conducting uh, this program today on community based early warning system. And also, uh, Disaster Manager par excellence, uh, Professor Dr. Surya Prakash, sir, head GMRD division, for his uh, support. And also, Dr. Hajit Kaur, Junior Consultant and IDM, and uh, the IT team behind, and Anil uh, Kathar, Junior Consultant, and Dr. Raju Thapa, and also uh, Ambassador Saad Umar Farooq for enlightening us uh, with all the efforts that what we need to do for the community. Uh, concerned with my experience, I'll be uh, saying the state from which I belong. It's a seismic zone five state, very vulnerable state. And what we do, we have low line areas. We witness uh, the landslides also, recent cyclone also. We got damage from the crops. Recently, uh, concerned with the technology is concerned, you don't get anything everywhere easily available. So now we have started a program with all our community community volunteer, we requested them to install uh, Jilo into their mobile phone and by Android mobile phone, by which every day, 10 to 20 minutes, we go on talking to them. And we hopefully, uh, now we are preparing a inventory resource directory at the community level, so that where uh, we get the carpenter, where we get the tailor, where we get the medical shop, as, as well as we also have started identifying the temples and various worship places and open places where loudspeaker microphones are being installed. And regularly we visit door to door, uh, talking with the PRI bodies. And also we are trying to bring the youth together to come to this field to keep them safe, safe, keep their family safe. And finally, charity begins at home. What elaborately uh, Ambassador Farooq has already been elaborated with various explanation for the tips side by side that has been lined up. That is, uh, now the time has come for all of us that at least we should try on uh, doing something uh, exemplary at our own side. Some people are fortunate enough, they have resources, some people are not fortunate enough. So with whatever we have, we can go on trying. As uh, Professor Surya Prakash uh, sir has already elaborated, to go through the points that has been taken place today in the discussion and try to innovate. We have uh, every state have uh, Indian Metrological Department office, so we can go and talk to the director or the concerned person with our volunteers, those who are interested, sir, how you predict, how you get the warning, how we can uh, see, how we can see what are the color code that are being used for various warning. So in that way, the more we earn, the more we do for the community. Remember, uh, for disaster as uh, concerned things, you don't get even the government in time because government has all of missionaries, so they have to go all around. So community, as a community first responder, it is our moral responsibility to come up, to make a plan, 
and discuss together and also make a fruitful out outcome of this and try ourselves conducting a mock drill, even identifying the vulnerable maps and also talk with the concerned collectorate, subdivisional magistrate office, concerned person said this we have made, we require your support, how we can roll on. So in this way, the webinar will go a long way if you start practicing ourselves with whatever resources we have, even uh, the Android phone. Some people have one or two Android phones. Sometimes they use one Android phone, another is not working. Even that phone also in crisis time you can use with simply uh, connecting with a hotspot Wi-Fi. You can connect uh, yourself uh, to the radio and other uh, channels also. So easily available things that are to be kept in mind for all of us. And I hope uh, the fruitful deliberation will inspire all of us to do great things and on the way, we also require that whatever we have done to send the feedback to the GMR division, what we have done with our capacity in the community. So I thank uh, all of uh, our participants, those who are uh, here uh, today, and uh, they have been enlightened. And special thanks to Ambassador Saad Umar Farooq for sparing his valuable time, though the time was not uh, suitable from his end. So I started calling him from uh, five in the morning. So finally got connected. So I thank and hope that in the coming days, we'll do a lot of activities and we'll really help the humanity at large, whatever effort, but charity begins at home. Thanks to everyone. And uh, Mike, back to you, uh, Raju, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful words and uh, and talking right, for, right from the community heart talking and your work that you are carrying out at community service it's, it's an it's an exemplary set that how you can manage with limited resources the work that you do is really exemplary for other people also to work carry out community works you know day and night so uh, thank you for joining us sir uh, and now uh, to end this uh, whole webinar uh, i would like to propose a formal vote of thanks um, from on behalf of National Institute of Disaster Management and all Tripura Disaster Response Volunteer Association, uh, we'd like to thank first of all um, our patron, Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, VSM Executive Director NIDM, and also Professor Surya Prakash, Head GMR Division NIDM, for their guidance, support, and, and encouragement to carry out this um, webinar on community based early warning system. We're also thankful to Sri uh, Arup Dhar, sir who is the Senior Community Disaster Response Volunteer from all Tripura Disaster Response Volunteer, uh, Volunteers Association for uh, coming up with this uh, idea and, and thinking this whole topic as a very important topic that needs to be discussed and that needs to be highlighted. We're also thankful to our distinguished speaker of the day, uh, Ambassador Saad Umar Farooq, sir, uh, the uh, Certified Disaster Professional from Nigeria. We are also thankful to Dr. Harjit Kaur, Junior Consultant and IDM, uh, Mr. Anil Kathet, Junior Consultant and IDM, for their presence in the technical session and enlightening our participant with their experience and words of wisdom. Uh, needless to say, without the participant, this whole program would not have been successful. So a big thanks to our participants also for sparing their precious time and 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 being with us for these two long hours and listening to the speakers what they have to say and i hope you have some key takeaways to take away from these webinars and we will be happy to have your feedback whether positive or negative and we'd like to hear your feedback so for that you can uh, you know you can use the feedback link uh, from tomorrow onwards in nidm training portal uh, and from where you will get the certificate also the same portal that you use for registration for this program uh, from the same portal you will be able to give your feedback and collect your certificate and uh, so thank you very much uh, for your uh, for your attention and uh, and joining us for, in this training program and uh, no, hope we will see you again in uh, in upcoming uh, programs. So thank you very much and have a nice day and Jai Hind. Thank you, Farooq sir. Thank you very very much from my end here, and it is my great pleasure to be with the disaster management family. One great mm -hmm. family, despite the geographical distance, but we are a great family because yes. service to humanity is our religion that binds us together. Thank Definitely. you and God bless Thank us you. all.